Hola, buenas tardes. Quisiera darles la bienvenida a este nuevo encuentro del Espacio Digital Fundación Ceibal. En esta oportunidad conversaremos sobre la transformación digital de los sistemas educativos. Para eso y para ayudarnos a profundizar, estará Max Drami, un reconocido especialista internacional sobre las nuevas pedagogías para el aprendizaje profundo y con una gran trayectoria en diferentes roles escolares, en donde acercará temas como cuál es el rol de los docentes en esta transformación digital, cómo lograr incorporar tecnologías como la inteligencia artificial en estas transformaciones digitales de manera sostenible para lograr un acceso equitativo y a su vez productivo en nuestros sistemas educativos de estas tecnologías. Así que espero que este encuentro dispare conversaciones interesantes y a su vez que logre que encontremos nuevas maneras de seguir incorporando tecnologías a favor de sistemas educativos más sostenibles y más equitativos. Muchas gracias. El humor sigue acompañando los procesos de aprendizaje y de reflexión. Hoy hablaremos sobre la transformación digital en la educación. Y para ello nos volvemos a encontrar con la querida maestra, con una alumna adolescente, con un alumno escolar y con un padre. Ellos serán los encargados de mostrarnos cómo podemos liderar esos cambios. La respuesta está en la cultura, en una cultura que facilite el cambio, que permite y que respete la audacia y la innovación. Innovar implica reconocer riesgos asumiendo que podemos equivocarnos y eso también es parte del aprendizaje. Y parte del aprendizaje es integrar a la inteligencia artificial. Es que la inteligencia artificial es una creación de software que imita comportamientos y capacidades humanas. Y A. Ah, te confunde, ¿eh? No sabes quién es humano y quién es robot. Papá se cree que Delfina es un robot. Te felicito que viene a tu vas. De eso no me cabe duda. La veo distinta. Delfina tiene comportamientos mecánicos. No puedo creer que se lo crea, es un rancio, papá. Y ahora para todo trámite en la computadora te piden que confirmes que no sos un robot. Te dice, confirme que no es un robot, el captcha. En cada imagen que contenga una tortuga. No está fácil. Y estamos adaptándonos a esto de los algoritmos. Yo algo de ritmo sé. Por Zumba. Rit ritmo, no. Al algoritmos. El codo, you know. el codo. Merengue, merengue. Abajo, abajo. Ya rebajé 8 kilos. La inteligencia artificial es el futuro. Es el presente. Yo para estar en onda me hice un alias en el chat GPT. Un usuario, papá. ¿Un usuario? Sí, lo uso, lo uso. Le charlo a lo loco. Le pregunto cosas. Buen día, GPT. ¿Tenés idea de si Delfina es un robot? Pobre GPT. Es que todo no se puede chatear. No esperemos que la inteligencia artificial nos dé todas las respuestas, sino que nos incite a buscarlas. Que nos guíe a construir autonomía y metacognición. ¿Meta qué? Hay palabras que yo no entiendo. Smat, GPT-4, IA, RA, RA, SAMR. Se parece al conglomerado de artistas musicales que escucha Delfina. Carol G, Becky G, Bad Bunny, Osuna, Tiago PZK. Ay, Roger King. Este es un siglo de muchas siglas. GPT. Vamos aprendiendo a medir el impacto de los avances, la innovación y de la tecnología. Para el cuerpo docente implica pasar de transmitir a interactuar y también salir en búsqueda de más capacitación. Hay muchas herramientas que yo ya conozco y ya manejo, pero hay otras tantas que tengo que aprender. Todo lo que tiene que ver con la virtualidad, tiempo en pantalla, convivir con la realidad virtual, tareas de escritura más avanzadas, incluir imágenes. Ahí soy una alumna. La transformación digital permite contribuir a la igualdad de oportunidades y ayudar y acompañar a estudiantes que tienen algún requerimiento de accesibilidad en el ámbito de la comunicación. Inclusión, confianza e ir para adelante sin miedo. Incorporando cada aprendizaje al servicio de las transformaciones que necesitamos.
that is a, a very complex question. There are a, a number of different elements within that question. First of all, the idea of, of digital transformation. And, and the key word there is, is transformation. This is about leading change. Yes, it is a specific element of change around how we use and engage and measure and value our use of digital technologies. But it's also about leading change. And so whatever change we are implementing, building, creating, we need to be mindful that we create a culture that supports change, a culture that allows change, a culture that enables change, a culture that respects and allows risk-taking and innovation, a culture that perhaps acknowledges that as we take risks and innovate and look to change our behaviours, we might fail sometimes and we have to learn from those failures and keep moving forward. In order to achieve change, we also need to have some layers of specificity and strategy around how we in fact expect to and support this change to occur. So we can't say to people, tomorrow you need to all change. You need to do things differently because people will naturally say, well, well, how do I do that? By the same token, we can't say tomorrow, tomorrow by law, you will all do this. Because again, people will say, well, that goes against my principles, or I don't understand, or I don't have the competency to do that. And so we can't mandate change. Again, it goes back to building the culture that supports and enables people to enter into the change process at different levels. So if we look at digital, we might have some people who are very adept, very used to using technology, very proficient in the use of technology. And so perhaps what we're asking them to do is not a big step, but at the other end of the continuum, there might be those teachers, those people who are quite hesitant in using technology who are inexperienced. And so we have to allow and support them to enter into this process of change with that strategic support so that ultimately we're able to shift everybody in a change that is lasting, sustainable, and deep. So this leadership of, of digital transformation, digital change, we need to have a, a very clear vision about why we're changing and where we're expecting to go in that journey. We need to develop leadership and people who can lead that change across all of those different uh, levels of participation. We have to build capacity of all of our participants to cope with, to embrace, and to have success in change itself. Yes. An important consideration there is that last statement. How do we measure an improvement in the quality of education. What is it that we are looking to improve as an outcome? Is it academic achievement? Is it student engagement? Is it a layer of other competencies beyond just academic? So no doubt that digital and technology can amplify and connect learners and learning outside the four walls of a traditional classroom, a traditional school. No doubt that we can do that. But in order for digital 
to have and reach its true potential. We have to also look beyond traditional measures of academic achievement and say, what is it, what is it possible for digital to provide to our learners? And so as teachers and leaders, perhaps, that requires us to think about our role. What are we in fact asking of our learners in terms of using technology? We need to be people who can teach and learn in equal measure. And so there is a vulnerability there because as teachers, we are often in classrooms and schools where it's very possible that the students know more about the technology than we do. And that's okay. What that means is that we need to be vulnerable. We need to be able to say to the learners, let's participate in some learning together here. I can, as a teacher, help you activate the learning. I can look at my teaching practices to work out what will suit you most effectively. I can create a culture in my classroom that builds norms to help build safety so that students can innovate and take risks and create. I can, as a teacher, look to collaborate outside my classroom with my colleague teachers, with parents, with community, with experts around the globe. But that means I need to think intentionally about my role, what I'm asking technology to do, and what is critically important in terms of what I'm measuring. The pandemic, I think, certainly elevated very rapidly the importance of technology. I think it also elevated the need to understand the impact of technology. So technology not only being important, not just important, but also important to think about what is the impact that we are hoping for? What is the impact of technology on learning? Because digital needed to become more than just substitution and substitutional. All of a sudden, when globally, so many schools, classrooms, learners, teachers were flipped into a digital learning environment, student engagement, so the key to learning is engagement. Student engagement was on a knife's edge and students voted with their off buttons. Students chose early not to engage in this digital education because it didn't connect for them. It didn't connect to them. So many teachers, because of the rapidity of the shift, tried to just replicate a classroom and a lecture across a video camera and students voted with the off button. We learned very quickly that we had to change learners and learning. We had to change and move beyond simple transmission of information. We found that in our work, as we deal with many, many countries and many, many teachers and classrooms, what came back to us was that shift, that, that light bulb shift from transmission to interaction, to collaboration, to equal and equality of the use of screen and screen time. Organizations, teachers and classrooms that embraced that notion saw much deeper 
learning, saw much more authentic learning, saw much more engagement of their learners, but it was a, a significant switch to Flick. And so as teachers became aware of what is needed in a virtual environment, they had to reinvest in their own capacity building, their own professional learning. They had to reach out and say, I need some help here. Help me become better at this new craft. I'm still a teacher. And many of the strategies that I know and use are still viable and valid. But how do I navigate this notion of virtual and digital? Because there are some specific requirements in a digital classroom, in a virtual or a hybrid classroom. And so teachers had to, to change their roles. Yes, they could still use some of those great teaching strategies that we know work, uh, inquiry and, and simulation and, and graphic organizers. Reciprocal teaching via breakout rooms was now an option. Thinking about the time spent on screen was now a requisite. Thinking about how we might engage with VR and AR and mixed reality, how we might structure safe online environments were all sorts of things that now with the pandemic, teachers have had to embrace and live through and navigate. And it's been a significant shift for them. The challenge now as we go back to face-to-face -to -face schooling is not to lose those lessons that we've learned, not to lose those skills, because together they can be a powerful package, powerful package for education. Yeah. It's a very hot topic, isn't it? AI. Chat GPT, artificial intelligence. I'm mindful always when we look at new digital initiatives of first and foremost, really thinking about purpose. And many of you will know the SAMA model, substitution, augmentation, modification, uh, reinvention. It, it's a simple, but useful filter, I think, to place over as a lens these new and exciting possibilities. Because it makes us think again about purpose. What is the purpose of engaging with any new technology, whether it's AI or VR or any other of the acronyms that we use? My, my second response around these new and emerging technologies is that let's not be afraid of the technologies. Let's look at the technologies with some honesty, acknowledge that they will provide some challenges in the same way the early days of the pandemic provided with challenges, but they also provide us some opportunities. I saw just the other day, as I was browsing, I was looking at a, a very well-known online learning environment. And up front, it was showing how it, had, it has embraced GPT-4, so chat GPT AI. And instead of just asking this bot, this intelligence to write me an essay about Plan Sebal, and I need you to include these words, instead of going down that line, the coders had been really clever. They used an example of a student doing some math. And the student had said, can you just tell me the answer? Okay, so the student will ask that. The response from GPT-4 was, 
it's important that you learn how to do this yourself. What do you think you need to do to multiply two by five twelfths? So it didn't give the answer. It gave some coaching prompts, but it got better. The student then responded. GPT-4 then took it another step and said, that's a good thought. But in this case, you don't need to find da, 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 mathematical language and then ended up with, what else do you think you could try here? Wow. That for me is high level use of this artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence that doesn't give you the answer but prompts you to search for that answer, that coaches you in order to build autonomy and metacognition. For me, that's a wow in terms of this new mode of AI. Similarly, there's some intelligence called uh, Dell E, Dell E2, which is a, an AI system that creates images and art from descriptions that you might type in. Now, I am no artist. In fact, beyond drawing stick figures, I have no artistic talent. But I love to use images and graphics when I present. And it's hard sometimes to find the right ones. I can now go and use Dell E2, this AI system, and ask it to create specific images with specific content for me. It will do that and create unique one-off images tailored exactly to my needs in a presentation. Think of that for students. Think of that for students who perhaps like me have no artistic talent. Think of that perhaps for students who have special needs in terms of communication and the way that empowers them and again, levels the playing field around teaching and learning. So AI and its relationship to my work at, at Deep Learning and New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. We, we talk about a fusion of teaching strategies. On one side, we have the traditional strategies that we know work. On the other side, often, but not always, supported by digital and technology, are strategies and, and ways of working like Dell E2, like ChatGPT and GPT-4. What we are saying to teachers is yes, use what you know works, but don't be afraid to experiment with these new strategies in order to meet the needs of all your learners. So a clear vision, we're doing, we are experimenting with new strategies to meet the needs of all learners. That's our driver. Let's see what we can accomplish. Let's see how we can enhance the capacity to learn and to share what we have learned through some of these new strategies. Certainly many of today's secondary students have grown up in a technology filled world it is part of who they are, which doesn't mean they are automatically discriminating users, but it means they are used to using the technology. And so they take to using technology more rapidly than previous generations. Technology has an attraction for them because it is part of who they are. And so, if we're going to leverage that in education, 
as teachers, as leaders, as policymakers, we need to be very clear about the purpose of using technology. So we need to be very clear about the outcomes we are looking for, the educational outcomes we are looking for, and then how technology might help us achieve those. Now, as teachers who are perhaps not necessarily comfortable with all of these new forms of technology, what that means for us is that we need to be aware that the ways we ask students to demonstrate understanding should not limit that understanding. And so there are some, some ways that we need to be rather open-ended in what we ask for as a product or an artifact of learning. And so if as a teacher, I only ever say to my students, I want you to write an essay on this topic. And we do another, and now I want you to write another essay on the, if I limit a student's response set to simply a written essay, what am I missing in terms of technology? If I said to students, you can respond to this provocation in any way you like, as long as it shows me your understanding. I'm opening up possibilities. I am quite possibly allowing students to engage and be engaged at a level that my previous essay doesn't come close to. So I'm respecting as a teacher that perhaps there are students who are much better at using technology than I am, that know more about technology than I am, than I do, are more effective at using technology and can produce and display and share their understanding and knowledge much more effectively than I could over a range of technologies. And so that notion of engagement, that notion of, of trust, that notion of setting the boundaries, but allowing students then freedom to work within those boundaries, I think is a really important part of engaging the independent minds of secondary school students. The Cebal of 2023 is very different from the Cebal of, of 2015. They have been very clever as an organisation to scan the horizon, political, economical, educational, and be aware of trends and shifts and movements in the landscape. Not only be aware, but adapt to and shift to be able to support. For example, Sebal moved from being an organization that provided devices to now, particularly with the, the people with whom I work around Red Global, a group of people who support teaching, who support teachers, who build capacity, provide professional learning. And so a real shift there in focus. And I think what has been done and what continues to happen and, and to be done reflects agility, it reflects uh, need, it reflects where the needs are across Uruguay and seeking to support and stay at the forefront globally of what is happening. <laughs>